Good evening. Thank you for joining this program produced by the Agency for Public Information, the API. I'm your host, Kathy Rose. This evening, we bring you an interview with the Comptroller of the Inland Revenue Department, Mr. Kelvin Pompey. There will also be reports on the launch of the multipurpose ID and the launch of their new program. But first, we'll have the news. Welcome to Newswatch. Good evening, I am Keisha Woodley. The St. Vincent and the Grenadines Department of Customs and Excise will host their Caribbean counterparts for this year's Caribbean Customs Sports Tournament. President of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Customs and Excise Sports Association, Sandra Noel, and PRO Trevor Dishong give further details on the upcoming events. This year, the Customs Association will be hosting the 41st Caribbean Customs Tournament. Now, this is a gathering of all customs officers from throughout the Caribbean region. And we gather every year on the Easter weekend to participate in various sporting disciplines. Our weekend of activities will begin on Thursday, the 24th, with our grand official opening ceremony to be held at the Western George Secondary School. On Friday morning at 5 a.m. we have our major fun walk from the Calico Plain Field into that district. On Friday morning at 9 we, our official sports would begin at Victoria Park where we would have match pass of the, the participating countries and we would have a day of sports show today. We do hope that all the participants arriving at our shows have a safe journey to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Be safe when they are in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, we know in this day and time that visitors to our shows, we like to know that they are safe and um, we, we want to ensure that they are safe when they come. Um, we also want them to feel welcome. Last Thursday, the front of a building that was formerly the Horseshoe Restaurant collapsed. Chief Engineer in the Ministry of Transport and Works, Brent Bailey, visited the site and gave the following report. In terms of the work program, in terms of the, for the demolition, the Braxa will be um, constructing temporarily a, a holding um, around the sidewalk and the building to prohibit persons from from passing under the, the, the scaffolding at present. Um, as I indicated before, the, I cannot um, in state with all certainty that uh, what we've done thus far is safe, and as such, I, um, the caution tape is there, but it seems as if persons are still utilizing the sidewalk. Um, and as such, we've, we've asked Braxa to put up a it, some barriers, um, timber barriers, to, to prevent persons from walking under under the, the section of 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 the of the sidewalk. Um, we hope by not this weekend, but the following weekend, that Braxa will um, be able to complete the works in terms of of the demolishing of the roof and the timber flooring that is covering the sidewalk. The United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, has issued its seventh call for funding requests to the International Fund for Cultural Diversity. Projects can cover a wide range of activities, from capacity building and cultural mapping to policy analysis and development, as well as entrepreneurship support and cultural industries consolidation. All possible submissions must be communicated to the National Commission for UNESCO's office before the online submission is made by April 15, 2016. 
Also, applications for the UNESCO Poland co-sponsored fellowship program 2016 are now open to Vincentians no more than 35 years of age. The fellowship offers 35 fellowships in various fields of science, technology and engineering and will be offered for six months in Poland, commencing October 1st, 2016. All applications completed in duplicate should reach the National Commission by March 27 at the latest. Finally, on Newswatch, the government of Russia, in collaboration with UNESCO, is offering co-sponsored fellowship courses in the following fields, energy and sustainable development, ecological management of energy resources, renewable energy, sustainable and renewable energy power generation. The fellowships will be granted in 2016 and should commence between October 3rd to 28th at specialized institutions in Russia. Candidates who wish to apply for a fellowship can obtain the application form at the National Commission for UNESCO at the Ministry of Education. All applications and supporting documents should be submitted in duplicate before April 6, 2016. Information on all of the aforementioned study opportunities can be obtained at the National Commission's website at www.svgncunesco.com or the Office for UNESCO at the Ministry of Education. Persons can also call the office at telephone numbers 451-2755 and 457-2676. Thank you for viewing Newswatch. The API program continues. Stay with us. Good evening. I am Keisha Woodley. An earthquake can happen at any time. Be aware. Drop, cover, hold on. Crouch and cover your head with your arms. Hold firm in an internal doorway. Avoid running outside or using stairs. Stay away from elevators and move away from outer walls, glass windows, and hanging objects. Remember, when the earthquakes, do the DCH. Drop, cover, hold on. Now, are you ready? Yes! Visit WeReady.org. Brought to you by Sadima and the European Union. A message from the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO. Welcome back. The Inland Revenue Department is again reminding Vincentians to file their tax returns ahead of the approaching March 31st deadline. Comptroller of the Inland Revenue Department, Mr. Kelvin Pompey, highlighted some of the major tax issues when he spoke with Shanna Daniel. Good evening. I have as my guest on this segment of the presentation from the API. Mr. Kelvin Pompey, he is the Comptroller of the Inland Revenue Department here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Mr. Pompey, you are no stranger to the API program and especially at this time. So welcome again to our program. Well, thank you and I think thanks to the Agency for Public Information for once more partnering with the Inland Revenue Department during our annual tax awareness period because we consider it um, this exercise basically critical to getting the message out to educating taxpayers informing them of their rights and obligations and essentially of at the end of the day getting higher levels of voluntary compliance mm -hmm. so we are well into march you observe this month as tax awareness month where you highlight issues um, surrounding tax Tell us how the month has been going in this regard and some of the issues that you think need to be highlighted at this time. Well, we, we have selected March. I think we've been doing this now for close to two decades, 20 years, believe it or not. And the 31st of March is essentially the, the deadline for filing income tax returns, that is for all employees. It also applies to self-employed persons and uh, non-incorporated businesses. They all have a January to December year end and are due to file returns three months after, which is the 31st of March. Additionally, the end of March is also the deadline for companies with a December year end 
to file their return and also for estimated tax payments for many other companies. Uh, March is also the deadline for persons with a uh, March birthday to pay their driver's license at the end of March and also for persons with motor vehicle um, last digit three. They also basically should renew their license by the end of March. So March has been and is um, in our tax calendar the, the, the highlight, the peak period. And it is the month which we collect the, the highest amount of revenue also. And so we have taken um, this period over the years to um, inform and to educate. Tell us about the um, various types of taxes or mandatory contributions that exist. Tell us where you have the most compliance and the least compliance. Well, we, we, we administer several um, tax types. The major tax types is the corporation tax. Mm -hmm. That is a tax payable by all companies in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We also have a withholding taxes. We have personal income tax, of course, that we all employees and self-employed persons would pay. We also have the value added tax, of course, our, 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 our major one. And of course, we have different licenses, the motor vehicle license, the liquor license, and so forth. But we primarily con um, concentrate on the personal income tax, the VAT, and uh, the corporation tax, as well as to some extent the withholding taxes. We, we have seen over the years, and that is why we move out, a uh, direct relationship between our education and uh, taxpayer compliance. We recognize that there is a direct and positive correlation between them, that the more we educate persons, the higher the levels of compliance we, we see. Um, specifically for the VAT and the PYE, because these are the two tax types that an employer or a business would withhold monies either from a customer coming in collecting the VAT or from employees collecting the PYE. And these are the two areas we find that we are having the most problems because what happens is that employers, uh, some employers and of course some businesses uh, deducting the PYE, collecting the VAT and not remit remitting it to the income tax department. And we are looking at ways and means in which we can specifically target these groups because this, this money that is withhold, the trust funds, this really does not belong to the employer and should be paid over to the Inland Revenue Department. So I, I, I think the third party um, trust funds, the VAT and the PAYE, are two of the areas in which we are having the most problems. Mm -hmm. What about <coughs> measures um, to be put in place to ensure that people comply and file the income tax? One of the mechanisms we are looking at right now is that any company or organization who wish to receive benefits or, or concessions also from the, the government in terms of a contract or duty-free importation of goods or anything like that, they must first come to the tax department to get a certificate of compliance. And we have seen, that is already in place and we have seen it working mm -hmm. because once they are sent to the tax department, essentially we then have a discussion with them. They are brought up to date in terms of what they owe and a commitment I think is made at that point and, and we think that is a very good measure. We are also working at other measures around that. We, For instance, we, we have a problem also with property taxes because that's a tax type in which we have a compliance rate of just about 50%. And we are also looking at the ways and means in which persons can be incentivized, so to speak, to comply. And uh, we, we would like also that where homeowners or, or whether it's, it's a student, whether it's parents or whoever are receiving anything from the state that they must first show that they have paid their property taxes. So those are the kind of instruments um, we are putting in place. We, however, have gone, I, I, I think, a, a route or a step that we have never taken before. We have actually forwarded to the Director of Public Prosecution um, the names of, of businesses individuals and companies who in our assessment need criminal action to be taken against them and as I speak the DPP and the team are working along with the department to prepare the relevant cases so very soon we will be hearing of persons being arrested for non-payment of taxes. Wow and these are 
businesses who would have not paid for a number of years? Yes, I, I think it's, it's primarily we are, as I said earlier, targeting first the VAT and the PYE. Because okay. these are monies that belong to individuals who gave it to the business to pass over to right. the tax department and they have kept it. And uh, yes, it's, some of these go back for quite some years and we are working and we hope, we had hoped that within this month that we would have been able to see, you know, the, the DPP's office actually moving forward with an arrest warrant. We, however, I don't think we are too far from that, from that happening. We do recognize, as I said earlier, that most persons, most taxpayers are fully compliant and cooperative with the tax department. I must say that most taxpayers mm -hmm. are highly compliant taxpayers and they do come in and pay their fair share of taxes. And ironically, we, we have found that to a large extent, the persons who do not pay their taxes in our assessment are persons who are in a position to pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. But they are deducting these monies and I think to, to most cases using it on their personal behalf and uh, thus preventing the state from getting access to these funds and for developing our country, as we know we need to do with our tax revenues. How hard or easy it is though to do, to file these taxes? Because I do not know, maybe because it's a lot of red tape involved, why, why this is the case. How hard or easy it is to do that? No, I, I, I think once you're generally, once you're registered for a, 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 a tax set, let's take PYE. An employer would put his system in place so that each month as he pays his employers, he would then deduct the taxes and uh, remit it to the tax department. That facility also, the PYE, is now online, which means that the taxpayer does not even have to really come to the department to file. They can do it from the comfort of the home or the business. What I think happens is that the, the temptation of having the cash in hand Basically, you have some businesses that give in to, to, to that. They may be experiencing cash flow problems or, or the sort, and they decide to use the, the VAT or the PYE. And uh, then the time comes to, to, to pay it up, and they do not have the, 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 the cash. There are others who deliberately set out to collect the money and basically, in, in a sense, steal it because it is. It is theft of, of, of government resources if you're collecting the monies and not paying it into the department. We have been um, doing our part in terms of overall education, um, educating the, 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 the public on ways to comply. We have our weekly matter of tax program um, during this month. We do move out and in a lot of ways we, we do have an ongoing and robust taxpayer education and compliance program and it has worked as I as I as I said before. During this month our our e-filing team and our manual team because we still have the manual system in place are busy um, assisting taxpayers. We are going out to different businesses. Once a business you have certain number of employees you can just call in. We'll send a team. They've been working along with all schools and um, clinics and police stations and so to, to get government employees um, returns in as well as the private sector and that has been working. But we do have on a daily basis I think hundreds of taxpayers being flooded into the department to get the assistance and right now most of the staff basically is in uh, um, tax filing assistant mode in terms of helping persons to meet the March 31st deadline. Okay, so you would say that it is somewhat easy and convenient? Um, well, yes, given the, the, lo the, lo the location of the department, it is fairly easy to, to comply. There are out districts in terms of the Grenadines Islands. We do have to, I think, have an online presence there. I think the tax department need to actually set up um, sub offices in these Grenadines Islands, particularly right. Beckway, Union Island, where taxpayers can have, I think, one on one interaction with tax officers because we do experience, I, I think on average, lower levels of compliance from the Grenadine Islands, ex especially for property, property taxes. And we think one of the reasons for this is that, that they are devoid, in, in, a, in, 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 in a sense, of the ongoing interaction with the tax department that those persons on the mainland may, may have. And so that's one of the things that we are looking at. But what we are doing in the interim is to ensure that we send frequent department teams to the different islands 
um, the Grenadine Islands to give assistance um, in, in, in matters of taxation. What final words do you have for taxpayers? I know every year it seems as if you're pleading <laughs> for persons to comply. What's your message this time around? Well, I, I think we, we know that taxpayers, they wait on us to give them that, 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 that cue. Um, to, to comply. But I, I, I want to encourage persons, I, I think first to thank those, the majority of taxpayers who have been working along and working hard with the department and cooperating um, in getting, getting the tax message out. There is no doubt about that, that the majority of our taxpayers are hardworking, are hardworking taxpayers who have been complying. To those who have taxes outstanding, and are afraid to come to the department. I'm making an appeal to these persons to come in. The taxes are not going to disappear, especially these days with computerized system. <laughs> Once they're there, they're there to stay. And your best option is to come into the department and let us sit down, let's see how we can work out a settlement figure or payment packages. Because if you owe taxes, you do not have to pay all at the same time. The tax department understands that persons may have cash flow issues and then we could sit and we work out payment over months or sometimes even years on a given um, tax balance. So for those persons who may be in that situation, I'm encouraging them to come. To those, especially the ones who have been withholding the PYE and VAT, the department basically has committed itself to taking the necessary action against against these persons. But I'm also encouraging them, you can come in now voluntarily if you know that you have been deducting the PYE and the VAT and not been remitting it to the department and making an appeal to come in and let us reason and, 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 and settle the outstanding balances. Other than that, we would be um, going out there and finding these persons and taking the necessary action. We have been strengthening, over the years we have been hesitant, and you've heard me saying this, that we would take action. We have been hesitant in doing it because we did recognize we did not fully have the capacity to do that. But now we have strengthened our systems. We have had a, um, quite a bit of training in terms of how we go about enforcement. enforcement. We now have a full-time lawyer on staff, and also we have private sector lawyers working along with the department as well as the DPP's office and the AG's office. So we are now in a very strong position to take the necessary action against defaulters. And we, we intend to do that because I think we, we have recognized that there are persons who are only going to pay their taxes because they fear the consequences of not doing so. And we have to make the consequences, I think, quite plain to these, these, these defaulters. We will continue to be an accommodating tax department a tax department that, that encourages voluntary compliance, tax department that wants to train and educate and sensitize and let persons know about their rights and so forth. But at the same time, we would also be using the enforcement approach to those taxpayers who do not want to comply because the laws must be there not just for those who comply, but for those who do not comply, it, it, it is unfair that others see them not paying their fair share of taxes and we have a responsibility at the tax department to make sure that we are just and fair in the application of the tax laws and uh, as a result we have to then take actions against these these defaulters and we intend to do such well that is quite reasonable and um, i hope that persons will take advantage and heed your call to come into the department and to reason with you and i wish you and your department all the best all right, thank you, and uh, of course, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to work along with, with, with the agency, and thank you for your, your assistance in partnering with us over the years in getting the tax message out. All the best. Thank you. You are viewing a presentation by the Agency for Public Information. After the break, we continue with reports on the launch of the multipurpose ID and the launch of their new program. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Are you getting the broadband speed that you're paying for? Based on your contract as advertised, several factors may affect broadband speed, like distance from the provider's exchange to your property, the type of line to your house, or processing power of the hardware or device that you are using. To check your speed, you can use a broadband speed checker on the World Wide Web. If it's less than the advertised speed, you may be within your rights to complain to your provider. 
Always read your contract carefully. This message is brought to you as a public service announcement by Actel, the NTRC, and this station. St. Vincent and the Grenadines has begun the issuance of the multi-purpose ID to citizens. The process began on Friday, March 11 at the Registry Department. The purpose of the multi-purpose identification system is to provide a common identification card in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the organization of the Eastern Caribbean States, the OECS. The multi-purpose ID system, which was also implemented by the governments of Dominica, St. Lucia and Grenada, is important in facilitating the protection of citizens' identity and the reduction of identity theft. This report is by Ashisi Sam. Good afternoon, and what's your name? My name's Kalis Watson. Hi, Kalis, and how do you feel about getting your MPID? I feel quite excited, actually, because you can use it for different stuff, you know, in different countries as well, so I just feel excited. And to be one of the first um, people in St. Vincent to actually get it, I feel quite excited. So do you think that the other students of St. Vincent and the Grenadines should get this MPID? Yes, because like I said, it's a multiple, uh, multiple purpose ID, so it can be used in um, different countries and for different purposes. I think it's a good idea. Several students from secondary schools are the first to register for the multi-purpose ID card in St. Vincent and the Grenadines as the government began the rolling out of the multi-purpose ID card on Friday, March 11th. Director of the Information Technology Services Division, Andrew Bailey, who was instrumental in having the multipurpose ID system implemented here, explains the importance of this new ID system. It's a multipurpose ID system. What it does, it's really an identity management system that is capable of cross-referencing many details of systems around government that issue identity numbers. For example, you can use your NIS number to cross-reference, you can use your passports, you could use your health information system number and a host of variety of numbers that can be used. The purpose of this system one of the great, great importance of the system is to be able to cut down on identity fraud because you know identity fraud can be very costly and can be very painstaking for persons. Now, in the, in the case of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, you have a system like this and uh, if, for instance, for example, passport says ask you to deliver some information and if there is a query they can cross reference other information from the multipurpose ID to make sure that you are being vetted properly. Another case in point you have the private sector I go to say OT to take out a piece of furniture and I produce an ID card or some other card at some point in time, I'm hoping that they will be able to use the system to say, well, this person is really say who they are. And it is very important that we maintain the integrity of the information of an individual. The multipurpose ID system has also been implemented in the Commonwealth of Dominica, St. Lucia and Grenada as part of the OECS Electronic Government for Regional Integration Projects. It will facilitate the easy recognition of citizens' participating countries through the use of a unique form of identifier which includes a country code. This project was one of the major components of the ERIP project which was launched I think about in 2008. And it took a while but I know for sure that Dominica, whose registry was burnt out, I can't remember if it was last year or two years ago, they would have used the system for voting purposes. Grenada is also actively using it and St. Lucia to an extent. But we are now trying to get our students initially today on board because it is one of the requirements for CXC to have a picture ID. Now the electoral office was tasked in the past and um, it was very laborious, difficult, and logistics were not 
in place properly to deal with it because they, they were dealing with electoral matters. So this is a very good opportunity for students to take an ID card with them in the examination room and say, this is who I am, to prove their existence. Another example of, the, of this initiative is well that a non-Vincentian can have a multi-purpose ID. The banks these days are asking for two ID cards. Beyond the passport, what other entity within St. Vincent and the Grenadines can give them a second ID card with a picture ID? So this is very important that it gives the, the non-Vincentians an opportunity to be able to face the institutions like the banks in order to do transactions. We are here with the members of a number of secondary schools who are taking place in a pilot program for the multipurpose identification system, which we call for short the MPID. And it's a program that is being rolled out in a number of OECS countries, um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Lucia, Dominica, and Grenada, where all of those countries will have a common identification card and the citizens of each country will have a single ID number. In the United States and maybe in Canada you have uh, something that is like a social security number which is a number that is yours from birth and it is used for your ID, it is used to apply at banks, it is used for credit cards, it is used for a number of things and we don't have that sort of system in St. Vincent and the Grenadines with a number that will follow you for your life and an identification system and database that will grow up with you as you go along. We've had some money from the World Bank to implement the system across the OECS so that the card will be recognized region-wide, the number that you get, uh, the identification number will follow you around um, as you work and live and the data about you will grow. And we wanted to begin rolling this program out for a little while now, but as you guys know, we had elections recently and we didn't want, to, we didn't want people to get confused between the MPID, which is an ID for every Vincentian, no matter how old they are, and the voter's ID because the ID card that people have now is their voter's ID, it's their voting card. And you could only imagine if in the middle of an election campaign we started giving different IDs to different people, they would say, oh, the Prime Minister trying to register school children to go and vote. So we decided to wait until the entire campaign process, which, was, which had delayed us for a while, but we didn't want that controversy. That entire process was over so that we could begin rolling out not a voter's ID, but an identification card that every Vincentian can get, a unique number that each one of you will have for your entire life, and a means to help you travel around the region, work in the region, your health information will follow you, your tax information will follow you, um, whether or not you didn't pay your bills in St. Vincent and go try to start a job in St. Lucia, that will follow you too. Um, so the, the governments will be able to interact more closely. You will have ease in getting loans, going to the bank, getting your health information from one hospital to another. Um, and you will have a single ID that will be recognized not only throughout the region but hopefully internationally that you'll be able to travel on and do business on um, and will be accepted as a definitive ID. It's not, where's this ID? What's this? Where this come from? Who make this? No. They'll say, oh, this is your MPID from St. Vincent and the Grenadines and, and that will be something that is useful and usable. So it will bring the region closer together and it will make your lives easier. And um, we hope to roll it out from beyond this small group nationwide in a very short period of time. Bailey explains the process of obtaining the multi-purpose ID card. There is a requirement to have at a minimum your board paper, a consent form, which would include details of the person, your address, your age, 
etc etc and then after that it goes to a second phase which is called the vetting and verification now the persons responsible for vetting and verification has to cross reference whatever information that you are given to make sure that this information is truly what it should be and after it has been processed you'd be give, um, it goes to the final stage of printing a card the card then will now be then issued to the persons once the vetting and verification process is complete one of the important features of the multipurpose id is the ability to cross reference electronically different systems within government now we, it has the capability of cross referencing the registry information it can cross reference the health information for example nis wants to pay for maternity benefits nis probably would go on the card that is given to them but if they have any doubts that somebody is fraudulently using a number or a name they can cross reference because the id card would also have a picture of that person on it though similar the multi-purpose id card is not the same as the national identification card bailey explains the difference between these two important pieces of identification this card is a collection for verification of using different mechanisms to be able to identify who you are. Okay. The, the card that is done at the electoral office was predominantly mainly for voting, but it's also used in conjunction as an ID card. But this card would have more information than just that voting card. This card should be really given at birth and it takes you to death. And after you die, it, the, the card number is retired. Okay, so you would keep updating the card as years? Yes, as years go by, you'll be called in by the registry for an appointment to say you need to come in and update your information. There's an expiry date. So after, after that time, you have to come in. But sometimes persons can change persons can acquire additional records and nothing is preventing the person from coming in and updating the records that is within the multipurpose ID system. The governments of the Commonwealth of Dominica, Grenada, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines multipurpose ID system is funded by the World Bank. The World Bank has given us the money um, for the equipment the IDs themselves, the consumables, the software that is involved. And after you are the first ones in the, in the country who will get MPIDs, but very soon everybody uh, will have one. But you'll be able to say that you are the first in St. Vincent to get an MPID. Uh, this is mine, but it's not really mine because I didn't take all my information. But this is what it looks like. And you guys can look at it, except, you know, imagine a better looking face there. <laughs> but but that's, what the, that's what the ID card will look like, and soon every Vincentian will have one. And all of your information can be stored on that one card. Um, and that's why it's called a multi-purpose ID. All of your information will be stored on that one card. And then you'll be able to do business and live life, essentially, with just one ID card. And all you'll do, like how you update a passport as you get older, you would update, you would update your MPID uh, photo, but the number will follow you um, as you go through life. The main reason for this multi-purpose ID card is to provide one common ID card in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the other OECS countries to identify individuals among different systems. The multipurpose ID system follows the August 2011 implementation of the OECS Free Movement of People. Through the multipurpose ID system, countries will be able to establish agreements to utilize each other's database to verify the authenticity of the identification of travelers. This will allow for easy integration of citizens as part of the OECS integration process enabling seamless and accurate movement of persons to work and live across the economic union. 
Ashisi Assam reporting for the API. <laughs> Mosquito bite, kill up the mosquito them one time. See, car come from mosquito bite, kill up the mosquito them one time. Get mosquito away from us. Make sure you stop up your deep products like half spray and cream. Make sure you run mosquito up this easy. See, car come from mosquito bite, kill up the mosquito them one time. See, car come from mosquito bite, kill up the mosquito them one time. Stop mosquito today, keep Zika away. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. The Ministry of Education collaborates with the Caribbean Development Bank, the CDB, to provide another avenue for disadvantaged people to improve their economic prospects through vocational education and skills training with the new program. Another nexus in education for workforce development. An official launch ceremony was held on Tuesday, March 8 at the Girl Guides headquarters. Here is more in this report. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines forges forward in its efforts to revolutionize the education sector. Access to another nexus in education for workforce development, or the ANEW program, was officially launched on Tuesday, March 8th at the Girl Guides headquarters. The program, which targets unemployed heads of households or at-risk persons between the ages of 17 and 45 years, is expected to enhance the economic opportunities for its participants through skills training in areas such as data operations, furniture making, and small engine repairs. In opening remarks, Senior Education Officer with Responsibility for Technical and Vocational Education and Training, Endel Johnson, gave a brief overview of the ANEW program. The ANEW program, another nexus in education for workforce development, is one component of the TVET development project. This project is financed by the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and with a loan from the Caribbean Development Bank. The program is expected to run for four years. During the four-year period, it is anticipated that training leading to a level one Caribbean vocational skills certificate will be provided to approximately 1,000 participants. These 1,000 persons are targeted individuals who are between the age of 17 to 45 and must be unemployed, dropout and uncertified school graduates, single parent mothers, fathers who are unable to finance further training, household heads with no certifiable skill and or low skill level, and those who are deemed at risk. The annual program is coordinated by a committee consisting of representatives from the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Social Development, Youth Affairs, Ministry of Health, and other social partners. This committee, along with the other implementing agencies, is responsible for the planning and management of the program. The annual program commenced in September 2015 with an enrollment figure of 188 persons spreading across the four technical institutes. This represents 66, 69.6 percent of our targeted population, which was 270. There are several reasons or factors which prevented us from achieving our targeted population, uh, our targeted number. 
cohort. But the main one is the capacity of the labs or the workshops at the technical institutes. Many of our shops have met facility standard for the training of up to about eight to 10 persons at any one time. But sometimes what we do, we have to cram certain space. We have to in pull in a bit more than what is expected because there are so many persons out there who deserve to be trained. However, under the Technical and Vocational Development Project, the Technical Institute will be upgraded and thus will be able to take in more students for training. About $40,000 have been disbursed to a stipend, sorry, to the trainees thus far for transportation and childcare services. Discussions are ongoing as to the best method for the engagement of counselors for the prov provision of psychosocial support to the trainees. I will take this opportunity though to impress on our principals and staff to continue to engage these trade and encourage sorry these trainees to endure for a few more months for the pro program should be finishing in June July Chief Education Officer Luan Gilchrist took the opportunity to outline key features of the new program which she anticipates will lead to overall improved school attendance and retention rates Following from a previous project, of which a component was the development of adult education and technical and vocational education and training, is this CDB skills development project. And I must say that the scope of the project is very focused on developing not only TVET in schools, but also the skills, the TVET skills of the out-of-school population. It is designed, this component of the project, to offer basically a second chance to those students and the youth and the older folk up to the age of 45 who need this second chance to either acquire or refine their refined skills and in so doing be awarded portable recognized certification. Now this program also targets heads of households because we know that the survival of the family, of the society, of the nation depends on the earning capacity of the heads of households. And we are especially interested in the Ministry of Education in training our adults and our heads of household so that the benefits derived by them from the training will redound directly to the benefit of their children. Primary and secondary school children, although support exists for their attendance at school and their retention in school, we do need for the parents of these children to have a great earning capacity. We need for the parents to be employed so that they can support their children's attendance at school. So everything that is done in the Ministry of Education is linked. Things are not done in the ministry in an ad hoc manner. Every activity, every focused activity is linked to the other, either directly or indirectly. So participants of this new program, please, you are here because we sat down and thought about the needs of the country. We thought about your individual needs. We thought about your needs as a specific group of people at risk and of your families who might be placed at risk if you were not trained. Hence, the A New Program. Representing the Caribbean Development Bank, Social Sector Division Chief Deidre Clarendon applauded the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines for this new initiative, which she states is in line with pro-poverty reduction strategies geared towards greater social and economic development. We are very pleased at CDB to collaborate with the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Ministry of Education in particular to implement this important program 
aimed at providing relevant skills development with regionally recognized certification for unemployed and vulnerable persons in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I must congratulate the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and again the Ministry of Education in particular for the, being awarded the, the ability to certify and to provide CVQ certification. Their new program is consistent with pro-poverty reduction strategies. It is also reflective of the kinds of innovative responses which provide sustainable employment opportunities for those desirous of becoming productive citizens, thus contributing to improve livelihoods for themselves and their families. Their new program with the main focus of our, was the main focus of our discussion when we met with the ministries of finance, economic planning, education, when we developed the TVET program five years ago. Then, and more so even now, it is, was recognized that in order to improve the pool of skilled and certified nationals, there was the urgent need to provide opportunities for persons to receive competency-based training and certification in areas which are aligned to the labor market. Chair, improving access to relevant skills training to address unemployment and provide opportunities for the economic well-being of individuals and families is a well-established model. In a 2015 study commissioned by CDB, which was entitled Youth are the Future, the Imperative for Youth Employment for Sustainable Development of the Caribbean, it was concluded that one of the main causes of youth and adult unemployment was lack of relevant skills. Certainly, while the inadequate skills include competency-based skills in TVET, which are linked to the needs of the labor market, they also include employability and life, life skills, such as teamwork, critical thinking, and communication skills. The critical shortage of skills is compounded by the lack of adequate work experience, a poor work ethic or attitude, and limited career planning in non-traditional areas like cultural industries, ICTs, and green professions related to renewable energy and climate change adaptation. Here in St. Vincent and the Greater Danes, like many other of our borrowing member countries, work permits for foreign nationals are provided for positions which cannot be filled by skilled nationals. Thus, between 2014 and 2015, more than 640 work permits were approved here in St. Vincent and Grenadines, many of which were for jobs which could have been filled by skilled and certified nationals. This contributes to a situation where labor force participation among the 15 to 24 year age cohort is around 47% for the region, including St. Vincent and the Grenadines. As outlined in the CDB study, we are very conscious that the consequences of high unemployment are evident at the individual, family, community, and national levels. Some of these include a lack of means to support oneself, participation in negative behaviors to gain income, low self-esteem and hopelessness, reduction in disposable income, and in a greater burden of caregivers and other household members, high youth crime rates, and increased costs of crime prevention, enforcement, and imprisonment, as well as health services to deal with teenage pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, drug addiction and violence, including domestic abuse. As this, this requires a major transformative change in education and the training sector. This will entail improving the integration of TVET into general education, promoting career education in the secondary school systems, instituting competency-based TVET instruction with on-the-job training at the, at the technical institutes and the St. Vincent and Grenadines Community College. It is therefore imperative to invest in skills development activities which provide a basis for persons to access, access jobs, including the prospects for self-employment and even providing jobs for others. In his address, Minister of Education, National Reconciliation and Ecclesiastical Affairs, the Honorable Sinclair Prince, said that he is pleased TVET projects such as the ANU program are leading the way for the education revolution. Prince also noted that in recent times, TVET is becoming increasingly destigmatized, waning notoriety. 
a couple of weeks ago, we witnessed the passing out of the first cohort of CVQ graduates in level one electrical installation. And today, we launched the access to another nexus in education, the ANU program. All these initiatives are in keeping with the general philosophy of the government to make education accessible to all for living and production, and at the same time provide a vehicle or a pathway out of poverty. In this period, government expects the revolution, that's the education revolution, which we have spoken about for so long, to focus on the main objectives relating to quality re relevance, living and production, excellence, professionalism, opportunities for continuing education. And this revolution, of course, as I said some time ago, encompasses a number of other small revolutions. And one of them is a revolution with respect to TVET. It is becoming destigmatized. It's also becoming one of the flagships of the education system here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and I'm very proud of that. We shall continue to focus on the objectives of paying particular attention to the poor, the marginalized, and the vulnerable. The general philosophy of this government, of course, has been manifested throughout this country in a number of areas. We have seen it in housing, we have seen it in agriculture, we have seen it with respect to the elderly, we have seen it with respect to the general poor, and how the government treats with these people. Any education system is judged by how it responds to the social conditions of a country, and further, how it prepares the people for the contemporary environment. We recognize that low levels of skill certification militate against the ability of the poor, particularly the youth, to secure gainful employment. And there is a high level of expressed need for improved educational attainment and skill certification linked to enhanced employment opportunities in a number of sectors, including construction, hospitality, and the tourism subsector in particular, areas which are identified as growth sectors in the economy. The participation of certified skilled nationals in these and other sectors would assist St. Vincent and the Grenadines in building its human capital base and expanding the economy. The ADU program provides financial and social support for unemployed in and out of school at risk male and female young adults. Specifically, the program provides finance and support to trainees unable to finance their attendance in the technical institutes, dropouts and uncertified school graduates, single parent mothers, fathers who are unable to finance further training, household heads with no certifiable skill and or low skills levels at risk youths and adults. This must be, this must be an exciting time. Um, and I hope that people who are willing to enhance themselves, who are willing to develop themselves, know, know of what, what is going on here. A lot is happening in Tibet, a lot is happening in education, and I would challenge the people who are running this program to ensure that the entire country knows about this and understands it and takes advantage of it. Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, I'm Sharish John. We have come to the end of this evening's program. Thank you for viewing and remember to join us every Tuesday and Thursday at 8 each evening and on Saturdays at 5. Enjoy the moonlight. Good night. I'm Kathy Rose.